Hi, everyone. Dr. Eric Westman here. And it's my great pleasure to have today Dr. Stephen Kunate. Welcome. Thanks, Eric. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm a professor uh, in the Department of Medicine at the University of Sherbrooke, uh, which is about four hours by, by car north of Boston, uh, east of Montreal, about two hours. So just north of Vermont. And I was lumped in in the, in the area of, of uh, brain aging. Uh, and my interest in ketones, and especially in relation to epilepsy, which I was working on in Toronto, was uh, in relation to brain development. And I, I, I learned uh, at an early stage in that sort of line of, of inquiry that ketones are actually physiologically essential for early brain development. And the fact that we're uh, trying to use them therapeutically in adults and perhaps in kids too, is I think uh, you, an offshoot. But underneath that, there's a physiological need for them in the brain during early development that we have pretty much lost track of. And I keep promising myself to, to sequester myself for a few weeks and, and get a paper written on this because I've got all the references and most people don't really realize the extent to which they're important for early brain development. So I thought, you know, if they're important for early brain development, perhaps they're important for brain aging as well. And, uh, you know, it doesn't get more exploratory than that, but it, it has it has gone forward in that's pretty hard to establish, um, but um, what has been shown in two, two different studies is that at birth, the, a third of the brain's energy requirements are provided by ketones, a third. Um, that's two separate independent studies. So it, it suggests there's not enough glucose in the system to feed the brain uh, to meet its requirements at that stage. And that, that requirement for ketones goes down. It's supplied by um, medium chain triglycerides in mother's milk. In women or, or infants that are not on mother's milk, um, it, they're still provided from the body fat stores that a normal term infant has. So it becomes more of a challenge for a premature infant or a low birth weight infant to meet its brain energy requirements and grow normally. And those are the babies that have the, the highest risk of, of, well, basically neurodegenerative problems or, or delayed neural development, I should say. Well, I was studying omega-3 fatty acid uh, metabolism in the brain, and the parent uh, of the omega-3s is called uh, alpha-linolenic acid. And we had a technique to study it with what's called a stable isotope. So it's not radioactive, but it is, it's is—it's got a marker on it that allows you to see how much of that stuff you, you give has transformed to the end product you're interested in, which was docosahexaenoic acid, DHA, in the brain. And the anecdote is that we saw that the conversion of alpha-linolenic acid to DHA, that was novel. Um, we were trying to study it in living animals at the time, which was novel. And what, what blew me out completely was the fact that most of that tracer ended up in cholesterol and palmitic acid and oleic acid in the brain and not in DHA at all. So there was the expected conversion, but there was this whole area that most of the tracer was actually going elsewhere. And I, I thought, how can that be possible? What, what's, what's the biology, the intermediary metabolism? And the ketones are produced from alpha-linolenic acid is in soybean oil. It's in flaxseed oil. It's in anything green that you can eat, actually, but the oils. Um, and it's, um, it's got three double bonds that are relatively easily beta-oxidized, not per-oxidized, but beta-oxidized, which means broken down to make energy. And a lot of the carbon that is broken down by that process ends up being recruited into lipid synthesis through ketones. And in fact, ketones supply about 90% of the, the carbon that you need to make lipids in a newborn as well. So a child needs ketones to make cholesterol in the brain. Yes. I learned that from a father of a child with cerebral palsy in Indonesia. He was told his child would never walk or talk. And he asked why. And they said he doesn't have myelin in the brain and, and cholesterol and he said, well, how do you get cholesterol in the brain? And they said they didn't know. So he looked it up, kind of like the old movie Lorenzo's Oil, where the parents are in the library 24-7 trying to figure it out. You, you can make it without ketones. So cholesterol is part of the lipid structure of the brain's a nerve cell, whether it's an astrocyte or a neuron or the myelin itself. Is, I've got long-chain fatty acids in what's called phospholipids. That's the way they're um, put into membranes. But there's also molecules of cholesterol in there. And the brain is largely autonomous uh, in relation to most of the fats it accumulates. It makes them itself. Uh, and so you, you don't have to eat cholesterol to get cholesterol into the brain. You can take a statin uh, and it will presumably re reduce your blood cholesterol. And in fact, some uh, early statins uh, do in fact block cholesterol synthesis in the brain are extremely dangerous uh, for 
for uh, malformations. So, so women who are at risk of pregnancy and um, are, need to take a statin have got to be on an anti on a con on a contraceptive to avoid that that huge risk. So, cholesterol is extremely important for early brain development, and ketones are part. They they're a major substrate to make the cholesterol in the brain. They're not the only ones, but but they are the main one, at least uh, in the first two years of life. So, if the how else can you make cholesterol? The, the well, green... glucose we know can can be is converted, and most people sort of stopped inquiring as to where the carbon from glucose for, for cholesterol comes from once they they stumbled over glucose. But in fact, ketones are a much better substrate for for glucose uh, for cholesterol synthesis in the brain and saturated fats. It's not just cholesterol. So to make myelin, as you said, absolutely, if you want to try to, uh, and, and this applies to aging because myelin deteriorates with age as well. And so perhaps I hadn't thought about whether you could correct the hypomyelination in, in childhood, a genetic disorder, presumably, but, uh, but we think we are seeing evidence of improved myelin structure in older people that are on a ketogenic uh, intervention. So it's and consistent. The excuse me, the demyelinating diseases like multiple sclerosis would be a, a target that might theoretically improve. Absolutely. And, you know, I don't know if anyone started to look at that, but it's it's definitely worth a go. Well, so I had the great fortune to travel around the U.S. Uh, well, once to Vancouver, so it includes Canada. Uh, talking to people and on Saturdays, people would, you know, come out and talk about low-carb keto diets. This is before the pandemic. And several people told me their multiple sclerosis was better. And I know just enough about the disease to know that it comes and goes and that it's very difficult to know for sure unless you really stick with it or even better yet, randomize people 